Thank you for the words that remind us that so much of what we want to see happen in our world and in our nation comes when God's people are serious about their walk with the Lord. And so that's a good call for us. One of the things that, that God has placed on the heart of our church is a mission, a specific people group in Africa called the Sankaran. The first word there is thank you. As you know, we have been praying. Our covenant is that we will pray, that we will go, that we will send. And so we have one of our number who is going to be going in March. Clint Greer will be heading to the Sankaran on the 20th. He'll be there for about five days with the Sankaran people and sharing and discipling and, and witnessing and sharing the message. Uh, we Last week and in the weeks before that, we have been, been asking you to contribute money. I say thank you because we did raise the amount of money needed for Clint to go, uh, as well as the money he's raised on his own, as well as what the church has done through our uh, West Africa partnership. And so we want to say thank you for that. If you still would like to give, you can do that today. Just make sure you mark that for Clint's Africa or Africa, West Africa. We'll know where it goes. You can still do that. You can give a gift for that. But the biggest thing is, will you pray? Will you pray today for the Sankaran? Will you pray for this trip that's coming up? My prayer, and I'll tell you what I'm praying as your pastor, I'm praying that when, when Clint gets there, in the very first village, he just his socks blown off by what the Holy Spirit's already doing. Now, I'd like to see Clint's socks blown off. I'd like to hear him come back and say, I couldn't even wear socks the whole time I was in Africa. I believe the Holy Spirit can do that. And we're praying that. And that's my prayer. I hope it's yours. So let's pray. Father, we pray for a great movement of the Spirit among the Sankaran people. Father, we know the, the past that we have had and the, the trips that we've taken and the, the laws that have been in between, the, the, the questions about whether we should or we shouldn't or what we're doing. But, but Father, you've centered us back to focus on praying. Praying and, and, and as you lead, sending. And as you lead, going. But Lord, we know that, that you're not restricted by the stuff that restricts us. You're not encumbered by the barriers that, that, that are barriers to us. And so, Father, by the power of your Holy Spirit, we pray for a movement among the Sankaran people. The power of Jesus Christ to change lives and redeem. And, Lord, we pray that, that, that when we hear reports coming back, that, that the movement of the Holy Spirit is going among the villages and among the people. And, Lord, we don't pray that so that we can, we can look proud or put notches in our Bible. We pray that for your honor and for your glory. So that in that day when all nations and all peoples and all tribes gather around your throne, we'll be able to experience the Sankaran people lifting up praises and gathering in your name. Thank you, Father, for this burden and this privilege. Move among them, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, today we are going to continue talking about Revive. Last week we started looking at revive and it's um actually we started last week in psalm 85 will you not revive us again where god's speaking to his people about being revived and this is uh this is the slide we're using for the sermon series next week we're going to go to another familiar passage of scripture in ezekiel chapter 37 that valley of dry bones and and is this dry life i live is is this what it is and we'll look at that next week. Then we're going to look at that great revival, spirit, fire of revival in Acts chapter 2 the next week. Are you on fire? And then the last week we're going to look at times of refreshing from Acts 3.19. When God promises when we turn and are revived, He brings seasons, times of refreshing. This morning, we're going to focus on the little word, if, from 2 Chronicles Actually, more than the one word if, but 2 Chronicles 7, 14, if my people is where we're going to go. But we're going to start with the excitement of a history lesson. Six people are excited about the history lesson. We're going to have a history lesson this morning, and, and I think you'll find it, well, maybe not exciting, but I think you'll, you'll, you'll enjoy it. Bear with me. I think it's vital for, for the story. 
We're going to talk today about a movement of God. In 1904, a young man by the name of Evan Roberts, who was in Wales, got a burden for the Lord. He was a ministerial student, and he began to feel that God was sending him an urgent message, that, that God was getting ready to pour out a great and mighty spirit of revival on the country of Wales. He wanted to be a part of that. And he began to attend various revival meetings, and, and, and he began to be deeply moved by the Spirit. And as he prayed at the altar one night, he heard God say to him, Bend me, O Lord. And that was his prayer. Bend me, O Lord. Complete and total surrender to God's will. He returned to his home church. It was just a little church called Moriah Chapel in the country. And he, he, he talked to the pastor, and he asked if he could preach a message of revival. Now, I don't know his pastor. Never met him. I'm not that old. Remember 1904? But, but his pastor was a little reluctant. You know, a lot of times pastors get people that want to speak. And we're very guarded about our pulpit. But, and so he was a little reluctant. But this is what he did. He said, he said, after our prayer meeting, I'll let you and anybody who wants to stay share a message. So Evan Roberts said, fine. And after the prayer meeting, the pastor said, Evan here, he like, has a message he'd like to share. If anybody wants to stay, you can stay. And so 17 people stayed to hear Evan speak, and they met in this little room. They listened to him. Most of them were teenagers and young adults. He spoke in that church with those 17 people for two hours. And that's when we know he wasn't a Baptist because they stayed and listened for two hours. And he preached for two hours. He had a simple four-point message, and it was this. Confess all known sins to God. Deal with any doubtful areas of your life. Be ready to obey the Holy Spirit instantly and confess Christ publicly. After two hours, when he was finished preaching, the 17 young people were all on their altars, all on their knees at the altar crying out to God. They prayed until 2 o'clock in the morning. And it was one of the greatest, greatest revival meetings, greatest movements of God in the history of Christianity. By the end of the week, over 60 people were won to Christ. And over the course of the next year and a half, 18 months, revival swept through Wales. Over 1 million people in 18 months were led to faith in Christ. They had tent meetings where people thronged to the tents because the church was too small. This is kind of a picture of inside the tent as people gathered there. And they came inside the tent to, to meet. People gathered outside the tents and they lifted their arms in, in, in prayer and supplication to the Lord. This was how they were moved by the Spirit. Miners were a big part of that. Wales was a big mining industry and, and the miners would come out of the mines and come to the meetings. This is a prayer meeting inside one of the mines, a pencil sketch, because it not only were, it was in the tents in the churches, but inside the mines during the day, the miners would meet to pray and have prayer meetings. These are men and boys going in 1905. It spilled over to the next year to revival meetings in Wales. These are actual pictures from that. Now, something interesting happened when, when this revival went on. Quickly, there were bankruptcies. In this whole area, all the taverns and bars closed because they didn't have any people coming to drink and carouse. In the mines, this picture of, of how they pulled the coal out of the mines, in the mines, the mules stopped working. And you say, now, why would revival stop mules from working in the mines? Because they couldn't understand the commands because they were used to hearing swearing. All their commands were, were, were sworn at them, and the men who had gotten saved and revived were no longer swearing. The mules couldn't move. They didn't know what to do. The police force in the town and other towns around there were disbanded for 18 months. There was literally no crime. They disbanded the police force. As a matter of fact, one story that is recorded says that there was one criminal brought to the court. They found a jury. They got a judge. 
the judge, in the midst of the case, witnessed to the man, led him to the Lord. He confessed faith in Christ. The jury ended the case by singing a hymn. Crazy. But that's what was going on in the great Welsh revival of 1904 and 1905. This revival crossed the Atlantic Ocean and began to swell through New York and New Jersey and even parts of Pennsylvania. The New York Times, believe it or not, the New York Times daily had a column called Today's Converts that listed all the people who were saved the night before in the revival meetings in New York City. The New York Times. A wild revival across the nation. If, if my people, Turn with me to 2 Chronicles 7, 14. Now remember all that that I spoke about Evan Roberts and uh, the revival in Wales because we're going to return to that in a little bit. 2 Chronicles 7, 14. The background here is that King Solomon had just dedicated the temple. Brand new temple built by God. Remember, his father, King David, wanted to build a great, mighty house of worship to the Lord, and God told him, no, no, that's not your job. And so it came to King Solomon, David's son, to build a mighty temple, and they built the beautiful temple that was built, and Solomon dedicated the temple. For seven days they worshiped, they sacrificed, they sang, they praised, they fell on their face before the Lord, and they worshiped him. And on the eighth day, the Bible says that, that uh, they held a sacred assembly, they observed everything, and on the 23rd day of the seventh month, he sent the people to their tents back home, joyful and a glad heart for the good that the Lord had done. The people were happy because they had worshipped in their new temple. At the end of that, after the people had gone home, and that great experience, that mountaintop experience of dedicating the temple, the Bible tells us, in 2 Chronicles 7, starting in verse 12, Then the Lord appeared to Solomon by night and said, I have heard your prayer, and I have chosen this place for myself as a house of sacrifice. So in a personal, private prayer time, Solomon, the great king, who had just had a great mountaintop experience for seven days of revival, in his personal prayer time, God speaks to him. And he says, I'm with you. This is my place. You are my people. He gives him a little warning in verse 13. When I shut up heaven and there is no rain or command the locusts to devour the land or send pestilence among my people, then he says, if my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, will forgive their sin." and heal their land. This scripture was given to Solomon now in a personal prayer time, but in the context of his community of faith. It was given to his people. His people who would hear and would follow with conditions. This was also a reminder, because it was to Solomon personally, that no matter what the community is, the community is nothing more or nothing less than individual believers and followers of the Lord. So this is a personal word, and it is a community word. So get that in your mind this morning. As we look at this passage of Scripture, you got to think in two tracks. Personal, is it left side or right side? And community, because that's who he's speaking to here right now. Now let's look at it a little bit closer. He begins by saying in verse 14, if. A little bit further down he says then. This is what we call a conditional statement or a covenant statement. If these things happen, then I will do this. If you do this, then I will bless you. If then. If then. It's the same thing that happens whenever you go for a legal contract to a bank or somewhere else. If I lend you the money, <laughs> then you will have to do this. If I do this for you, then you will do this for me. Then I will do this for you. And so there is a contractual uh, agreement here. This actually shows the dynamic relationship God had with his people and something else, catch this, it also shows the free will God gave his people. If 
then I will. Now, what's in the middle of that is this thing. You don't have to. If and then. If you choose not to, that's fine. It's your free will. But then no, these things will not happen. Or these things will happen. So it's a conditional statement. It's a free will statement for God's people. If my people, who are called by my name, my name, called or, or I like maybe translated, are known by my name. The people of God were known by their relationship with God. It was what defined them. Their great temple didn't define them. Their, their family structure didn't define them. Their worship or ministries didn't define them. them great, their great singing didn't define them. Those were all good elements, all things God gave them, but they were defined by His name. They were the people of Jehovah God. They were the people of God. If my people, who are called by my name, who are called by my name. When Isaiah went into the temple, we looked at it a little bit last week. The first thing he saw when he was in, in worship, when, when God showed up, was what? I saw the Lord high and lifted up above everything else. And his train filled the temple. The presence of God filled the temple. And the focus then was not on Isaiah, but the focus was on God because they sang, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord. Not Isaiah, 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 you're in trouble. Holy is the Lord. If my people, which are called by my name, if my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves this is a twofold act one is of the heart on the inside one is of the body on the outside and the ancient worshiper didn't separate the two they understood that when God said to humble yourself it wasn't just we would sit in the pew and think about God and and how good he is to us and how miserable we are but they found themselves physically bending the knee or even lying prostrate before the Lord because that was an outward sign of the inward humility, what God was calling them to. Psalm 31, 18 says, The Lord is near those who have a broken heart, and save such as have a contrite spirit. Psalm 51, 17, The sacrifice of God are broken spirit, broken and contrite heart. These, O God, you will not despise. Listen to Isaiah 57, 15. For thus says the Lord, the lofty one, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy, I dwell in the high and holy place with him who has a contrite and humble spirit to revive the spirit of the humble and to revive the heart of the contrite ones. Note the humble are those who are revived because of their humility. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves. And he goes on to say, and pray. Now, there's almost a progression here. Actually, there isn't almost. It is. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves, then the automatic response as you bow down spiritually and physically is not a demonstration to, 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 to show just a correct posture. But here, it is to enter in a dynamic, personal interaction with holy God. And that's prayer. What will happen whenever we humble ourselves? physically and emotionally and spiritually is that we enter into an interaction with God which is personal and we call that prayer. What were the disciples doing on that Pentecost Sunday when the Holy Spirit fell? What were they doing? Were they having a brunch down at the Golden Corral? What were they doing? Were they having a committee meeting to decide how they were going to build the next church? They were together in one accord. The Bible says they were praying, praying, and the Holy Spirit came. Here is the call to prayer. It's been said that every movement of God among His people, both in the Bible and since the first century, has happened only after deep, dedicated, personal, and community seasons of intense prayer. Not dictated prayer, not official words, but the pouring out of our heart and lifting our prayers toward the Lord. If my people, who are called by my name, 
will humble themselves and pray. And then he says, and seek my face. What is the point of prayer? What is the focus of humbling ourselves and praying? If, if we listen to the majority of prayers that people pray, and that even we pray oftentimes, the point of our prayer, the focus of our prayer, the reason we pray is to get something from God. Because our laundry list is always longer than our praise list. What is the focus of prayer? We'll humble ourselves and pray. What's it say here? And seek His face. The point of prayer is to seek Him. Our focus is Him. In our praying, we want Him above all else, above our needs, above our agendas. He is the desire of our heart. He is the reason we pray. He is the reason we humble ourselves and seek His face. Him and Him alone. In 1 Chronicles 16, 11, it says, Seek the Lord in His strength. Seek His face evermore. Jeremiah 29, 14, And you will seek me and find me when you search for me with all of your heart. Several years ago, I got intrigued by the word seek. And so I, I ran every reference of the Bible with my concordance, my big, thick, strong concordance, old school, turning pages, literally, and, and studied every scripture in the Bible that had the word seek or seek the Lord, that phrase. It took a long time. And I found out something that amazed me. It shouldn't have, but it did. Over 90, almost 95% of the time, when the Bible uses the term seek or seek the Lord, it is not talking about the lost. Over 90 to 95% of the time, when the Bible says seek the Lord, the Bible is speaking specifically to believers and worshipers. Us. Not someone else, not someone who's, who, who's deep in sin and lost as a goose, but us. People who believe and who follow. We are called, implored, compelled to seek the Lord. If my people who are called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways. Now there's a simple word here that defines the turning from our wicked ways. Very simple word. It's a word we don't like. We like to sing about it. We like to throw around for other people to do, but it's the word repentance. Again, when the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost, Peter preached that first great sermon of the church. The people who were convicted by the message, thousands of them, were convicted and they asked one question. What shall we do? It's in Acts chapter 2. And the first thing that Peter said was not join the church. The first thing that Peter said was not get baptized. He said that a little later on. The first thing that Peter did not say was, well, get your checkbook out or sing a song. The very first thing that Peter said at Pentecost, when they said, what shall we do? They were convicted of sin. He said, repent. Turn from your sin. Repent. The action that comes from humbling ourselves from praying and seeking His face, is and always must be turning from sin. Because the Bible is very, very clear. All of us are sinners. Paul said he was the chief of sinners. I was praying one night. Kathy and I were with some friends in college. We were praying one of those all-night prayer meetings that you do when you're young and you, know, you don't fall asleep as soon as you bow your head. Uh, when you're young, you can do that. And, and we were praying all night, and, and remember, one of our guys was praying, and he prayed, Lord, Lord, Paul says he's the chief of sinners, and, 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 and that he had a thorn in the flesh. And I remember my friend praying, if he had a thorn in the flesh, I've got the whole bush. Pouring out the heart before the Lord because of sin. Because we're sinners. The Bible says that all have sinned. Every one of us in here. You, and you, and you, and you, and you, and you, and me. We're sinners, and we're compelled to turn from our wicked ways. We can't escape this reality, no matter how we gloss it over, no matter how we try to redefine it in our culture. We are sinners. He calls us to repent. So that's the if. If you'll do all these things, we come to the little word, then. The conditions, 
God makes some promises. Most of the time, we would like the promises before the conditions. And here's how we define it in a little humorous way. Life is very, 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 very short. So what do you do? Eat dessert first. Right? See, but that's our condition. We want, <laughs> we want the benefits, the promises, the sweet, without having to do the if. But he calls us to realize the promise of God. We must meet the conditions. And that means we must humble ourselves, seek, pray, and turn from our wicked ways. Then God says, I will hear from heaven. God is in his place. God has his place and we have ours. It's a reminder that he is above us. And yet close to our repentant heart. Then will I hear from heaven and will forgive their sins. God promises to hear you. To forgive you. Out of the acknowledgement of us owning our sin, God says, I will forgive you. Psalm 32, 1. Blessed are those whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Psalm 103, 3. God forgives all your iniquities, heals all your diseases. We ask in the Lord's Prayer, Father, forgive us our sins. But the condition is that we forgive those who have sinned against us. However, and hear this, the ultimate reality, you're not hearing me, are you? The ultimate reality of forgiveness of sins is found in Jesus Christ and Him alone. In Acts chapter 13, verse 38, Therefore let it be known, brethren, that through this man Jesus is preached to you the forgiveness of sins. Ephesians 1, 7, In Jesus we have redemption through His blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of His grace. And by 1 John 1, 9, If we confess our sins, He is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. It is because of Jesus that we have forgiveness of sins. Now stop. Right here. Stop. Right here. Are you confessed? Are you forgiven? Right now, right here. Can you look to your life in that moment and say, Yes, Lord, I didn't know it all. I still don't know it all, but I know that I'm a sinner. And I've recognized that Jesus is the one who died for me, who rose again. And in Him I find forgiveness. And Lord, I've, I've done that. And if not, then right now, Jesus says, that little, that little twerk in your heart right now is God saying, now is the time to know His forgiveness. To find the condition of His forgiveness right now. And one more thing here. Sin is singular. There's really only one sin. You know that? We have lots of things we do in sin. There's really only one sin. And that's the sin of the Bible. And it is idolatry. Anything we put before God is sin. No matter how good it is, bad it is, or indifferent it is, anything we put before God is sin. He will forgive if we come. Then I will hear from heaven, will forgive their sin, and heal their land. The promise is still valid. Do we really believe that this can happen? Have we gone so far not according to God. First of all, I believe our land, first and foremost, is our personal lives. He can and will heal your land, your life, your family, your job, your friends. He will do that if, in fact, we humble ourselves and pray and seek His face and turn. But our land is also our nation. Can God heal our nation? Well, He's the same God that, that healed this nation that healed whales, can He heal us? This is a promised result of us humbling and praying and seeking and turning. This will not happen in Harrisburg. Sorry, Brian, no, no reflection on you. This will not happen in Harrisburg. This will not happen in Washington. This happens when God's people humble themselves and pray and seek and turn. If my people, who are called by my name, will humble themselves and pray and seek my face and turn from their wicked ways, then will I hear from heaven, 
will forgive their sins and heal their land. Now, turn with me back to Evan Roberts, Roberts and the revival he initiated. In his nation at his time, Wales was a part of Great Britain. They'd become a part of the Greater Britain continent. It was early 1900s. The leadership was detached because they were in England. They really cared less about the workers. They just wanted what they got from them. The people worked hard and could afford less and less. Inflation was rampant. Society was moving toward more and more and more moral decay every day. Alcoholism was rampant, and cities were not safe for families or anyone to live in. Cynicism and negative feelings grew deeper every day and every year. Within a decade of this revival starting in 1905, the whole world would be at war for the very first time in history. They spread across Europe. The United States got into it. The world was at war. This was the climate in 1904 when Evan Roberts began to pray and preach. Hopeless, helpless, cynical, moral decline. Does any of that sound familiar to anybody but me? But that was the climate. After, after all of that, Evan Roberts began in an unusual place with a simple message after a prayer meeting in a little bitty church saying, confess all your known sins to God. Deal with and get rid of any doubtful areas of your life. Be ready to obey the Holy Spirit instantly and confess Christ publicly. Actually, what he was doing was this scripture. That's where he got his inspiration. He said, confess known sins to God. If, you're, if my people called by my name will humble themselves and pray and seek my face, and turn from their wicked ways, that's confession. Deal with it. Turn from your wicked ways. Be ready. Then I will hear from heaven and confess Christ publicly, and the land is healed. The world is looking for the real thing. God has created in each one of us a desire to know Him and the power of His Holy Spirit. Few people are willing to pay the price God requires, hence we live Day-to-day, busy, gasping, mediocre lives when God never intended for His people to live that way. The world is looking for a church, a people of God, to manifest the power and the purpose of His church. Listen, and here is a very telling reality. If methods and promotions and scheduled meetings and crusades alone could bring true revival, our generation in in America would have seen the greatest revivals in the history of the world if all of those things brought revival. We have spent billions of dollars and millions of man hours and, and done hundreds and thousands of different kinds of meetings, and yet we have not seen true revival in our land. Matter of fact, we have experienced the worst moral collapse in the life history of our nation. And it's even in the church. Our baptism ratios, which show people who are saved and serious, they get baptized, is in the steepest decline it has ever been in our denomination and all denominations in our country. The baptism decline. What if? What if? God wanted to start moving among His people at Wrightsdale Baptist Church at a very unusual time. Sunday morning at (gasps) 9.51. It's almost Sunday school time. I I can't be on schedule. But what if God wanted to move right now? What if God wanted to say, forget your schedule, let me move right here, right now. What if God is saying to you and to me, you are my people. You, writes Dale, are called by my name. And and you, writes Dale, I call you to humble yourselves and pray and seek my face and turn from your wicked ways. What if God is saying that right here, right now? What are you willing to do right here, right now? Back in 1925 is the first time we ever codified it, but for years people sang a little African-American 
spiritual song that said this, Not my brother, not my sister, but it's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. It's me. It's me, O Lord, standing in the need of prayer. Father, will we learn the lesson of history back to Solomon's dedication? Will we pray? Will we seek your face? Will we turn? For Lord, we want revival. Oh yeah, we want it. But we want it to happen to those that we know need it. We want it to happen to those politicians that don't follow our agenda. We want it to happen to those Hollywood and sports figures that, that are in the news and act, living immorally. We want it to happen to those on the left that are against our agenda and those on the right who could care less. But are we willing to humble ourselves and pray and seek and turn? For Lord, no movement of God has ever begun when your people prayed those others need to get straight. So Lord, we want to be revived. Are we willing to be your people this day? In Jesus' name, amen. Will you stand with me, please? As we sing this time.